Antelope Springs Church. Um, I was thinking, you know, in the last few weeks, you know, we've had all kinds of weather. It looked like it was warming up for summer, and then we had yesterday, and so um, I thought it was very appropriate reading Psalm 19 this morning. So if you would stand me for the stand with me for the reading of the word. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their vo voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into the, all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let God be magnified. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise your name this morning. Lord, indeed, the heavens do declare um, who you are. They declare your glories, Lord. Um, you speak to us, and you've spoken to us since the beginning of time. I pray this morning as, as we've gathered for worship, Lord, that um, through your table, through the music, through the sermon, Lord, um, that you would again speak to us, that you would quicken our hearts, Lord, um, to focus our eyes on you, um, to ask ourselves what it is that you're telling us so that we can truly be your servants, Lord, and be available for you. Um, thank you for this time, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. 
just carry me. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. and stain he washed it white as snow he, he washed it white as snow he, he washed it white as snow Good morning, everybody. Please say hello to somebody before you sit down. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all again. Uh, if you're new with us, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Um, if you're a guest with us, uh, we're sure happy to have you here. At the back, we have a, a small gift to say thank you for coming. Uh, fill out your communication cards if you have any questions or, or anything you want to communicate of what's going on. Um, there's a, this is an ADHD day, so y'all just buckle up. Um, in the seat back in front of you, along with that communication card, is a trifold of everything that's going on throughout the week. Uh, all the ministries, Awana, uh, the life groups, uh, Celebrate Recovery, uh, Blast after church. So uh, get plugged in. Uh, if you have any questions about those, outside the, the door to the left, there's a little card to get the, the church app so that we can, uh, so you can find out what's going on, see what works in with your schedule, you get plugged in. I mean, even if you're not regularly attending something and your schedule goes awry, there's always a group to... Uh, get plugged in with and uh, people to plug into to uh, lift you up pray with you celebrate find a ride look for a new blower um, anything you want <laughs> uh, 
Um, so that's that. Uh, let's see. So got all that. Um, today's a good mission day. This past week, if you don't know what missions were involved in, it's uh, far-reaching. Uh, Aaron's two boys are, are in the ministry um, working in the southwest Arizona and Riverside? Yeah, Keith's a pastor in Riverside. In fact, he's doing a, he's getting his seminary degree, his, his master's degree. We're going down for his graduation. And uh, Tom is uh, with crew still in uh, in Riverside area. So Keith's in, in Tucson and, and Tom's in Riverside. So along with that, thank you for the update. Uh, along with that, uh, in the, out that back door to the uh, out that back door just on the right hand wall is our missions board. Uh, Daniel's uh, reaching out to people in Northern Africa, the Middle East, Daniel Blanchard, and sent an update that is, am is amazing to see because we're supporting him and he had some uh, unusual things happen that still were tremendous in helping reach people with the gospel. So that note's out there which is going to blow your mind. And I've been doing missions for a while, as is Kathy, for longer than me. Um, it's, it's amazing what, what Daniel has going on. Um, and I talked with Levina last week. I'm going long, so uh, it's, it's good. Um, so I talked with Levina this past week, um, and it was even more interesting. We have our Awana program here. And she got a note. From Awana, so we have Awana here. Awana is a worldwide program, and when our kids were in it, I would say there was probably about a half a dozen countries that were had the Awana program that it was reached. Pretty neat to understand, but the Awana program is now being plugged into public schools in Africa in exponential ways you wouldn't under wouldn't even fathom because they're so desperate for the word of God. So as you think of when you give, these are the things that your money is going toward. So David told me to make y'all laugh. That ain't working so well. Um, so when you give, know that that's where it's going towards. We're making sure that the gospel is known, and that's the most important thing. That is the, uh, the gold and silver that we take with us to heaven. Okay, good. Now I'm back. Um, I, there is no uh, uh, Sunday uh, after, after service youth group. Blast, thanks. I couldn't get, I couldn't get the B word. I was looking for it. There's no blast after service today. There's also no blast after service next week on the calendar. So if you've got youth that are involved in that, plan for that. If you're online and you're not here, but you're normally here, plan on it not being next week when you come back. So uh, just know that. But they are still having the student ministry uh, trip that they're planning. So if you want to plan to support them, even though the wall outside isn't up that I know of, uh, you can identify that in your it is up on oh okay it is up so if you want to support them in that go out and grab a card support them for for the trip that they have planned um let's see uh student ministries wall of money got that uh men's breakfast is the 13th at nine here so uh plan on that if you if you got guy friends if you know guys and you're not a guy send them this way heck we'll come pick them up so uh, plan on that breakfast here, a time of, uh, of Bible study, of worship, and uh, just loving on guys and lifting one another up. Uh, May 20th, the car show. Um, so that was kind of exciting this past week. Uh, it rained yesterday a lot, and lightning, and hail. Um, I was expecting, uh, I was like, maybe he's a mid-trip God. I don't know. Uh, so... Um, I got the note on Facebook, and I'm like, did, did Darren not, is this an old card or something? And I caught one at 3 a.m. when I finally, I was like, oh, it's raining, so we're not doing it tomorrow. So it's been postponed to the 20th. So the car show's the 20th. Still free popcorn. Ed, you're on the hook for popcorn now because I said it. Uh, free burgers, free donuts. Come and enjoy some cars. Invite some friends to, to just have a good morning 
enjoying fellowship and, and a good time looking at cars and talking with people. Uh, plan on the 8.30 till 1 here and uh, on the 20th. Ladies Paint Night is Friday, May 19th at 6 here. So plan on it, 6, right? 6, okay, good, I guessed. Um, I delete it after it's off. So in my mind, it's, yeah, I try and keep up. I stop. Um, and I didn't see the picture yet. I'll have to look for the picture. You usually have it up early. Um, Vacation Bible School, July 10th through the 13th is coming up. Registration's online. I mentioned it last week. I'll mention it again this week. If you're not doing anything, come and volunteer. It'll transform your life too. Uh, those who have done missions realize they go out in the field expecting to tell people about Jesus and realize they're just as transformed as the people they're transforming. So come and help. If you can't come and help, donate to, to support uh, those coming because we have people from that are coming from other churches that don't have a program over summer, and we have people that are coming who have never been churched and don't know anything about what's going on, and we want to make sure they have that opportunity to hear about the gospel. Uh, your sign-ups are at the information table. Um, let's see. Last announcement, next Sunday. All you guys and girls, write it on your hand or something. I got a Sharpie. Next Sunday's Mother's Day. Don't forget Mother's Day. You've been told it's on the internet. We're trending. There's five people watching, so <laughs> don't forget Mother's Day. 514, next Sunday. Bring them here. It's a good time. Um, that is all the announcements. Um, if you don't have a Bible, at the back table, at the welcome table, we have some Bibles for you. If you need one, uh, please let us know uh, after service. Make sure you don't go out here without a Bible. We want to make sure that you have a tool throughout the week so that you can study God's word because it's not just on Sunday, everybody. It's every day. Um, with that, uh, after service, we will have some chaplains and uh, leaders up here if you need any prayer. On the chaplain note, they're almost finished with the Chaplain's Academy. So uh, if you're interested in getting involved in the Chaplain Corps, uh, please let us know afterward. Put a note on your communication card. He does it twice a year, and uh, it will definitely transform um, your understanding of how you can serve God, and that's a huge thing. With all that, let's, uh, let's pray and continue the worship. Heavenly Father, thank you for all you do uh, in the service of the expanse of your kingdom and allowing people to know you. As we think of those missionaries here and abroad who are serving you both full-time and uh, part-time and of their free time, um, we thank you for the opportunity to partner with them and uh, we lift them up and pray for their safety, their security, the direction you are leading them and the honor of partnering with them and supporting them as they go, realizing we are missionaries where you have placed us as well. And what we say and what we do, uh, we are your light in the world. May we always reflect that. As we give this offering, we dedicate it to you, knowing that you will use it exponentially beyond our understanding, that your kingdom will grow. We look forward to the day we celebrate, all of us together in heaven. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Amen. Oh, God is good. And all the time. God is good. Amen. We have a good, good God. He has blessed us abundantly. And hey, if we haven't met before, my name is Jordan. I am the lead pastor here at Antelope Springs. Uh, this is the first Sunday of May, and on the first Sunday of the month, we celebrate communion here. Uh, so that is what we are going to do. Communion is something that Jesus began during the Last Supper as he had his final meal with his disciples, shared the Passover meal with them. And he instituted this uh, to remind them, even after he died, even after he rose, even after he ascended to heaven, even after Jesus was no longer physically present with them, he was still with them. And he is still here with us. There is going to come a day, there is going to come a time where once again, Jesus shares the communion meal with us. He told his disciples, uh, take this with me now because I will not have this meal. I will not share this with you again until we share it anew in my father's kingdom. There is coming a time where, when we will feast on this, the, the, the cup and the bread uh, together with Jesus, physically present, holy, real, as we share it with him in eternity in his kingdom. For now, while he is not physically with us, we remember and we reflect on his spiritual presence with us, that he has given us his spirit, that he is here with us as we take communion together. So as, we, uh, as the ushers come forward, I'm going to pray over the elements, and the ushers will, will pass them out, and, and we'll take them all together. Uh, but as this time is happening, reflect on the fact that Jesus is here with us. If you've got an empty chair nearby, even imagine in your mind that he's sitting right there because we have a good, good God, and he is here with us. Amen? Amen. Father, Son, and Spirit, we come before you humbly, understanding that you have given us this time to spend reflecting not only the fact that we are in each other's presence, but we are in your presence, God. Father, we praise you. We give you the glory and the honor because you are creator God who, who made this entire universe, who spoke this world into existence by your very voice, by the breath of of your lungs, you said, let there be, and there was, and it was good. Jesus, we praise you and give you glory for the work that you've been doing in our lives, the work that you've done in this world, how you took our sin on yourself and you bore that burden, not just when you hung on the cross, but as you walked alongside of sinners, as you shared meals with them, as you spoke with them, as you touched the sick and you took away their illnesses. Jesus, we thank you for the ways that you have been at work in this world, how you have come into our lives and healed our sickness and, and took away our sin. We praise you, Lord. That Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the work that you are doing as you lead us and guide us into all truth, as you remind us of the things that Jesus has taught us, as you uh, show us the way before us that you're wanting us to walk with you. Spirit, lead us into your truth. Lead us in your ways. God, we thank you. We praise you for this time we have together. And Jesus, it's because of you that we pray.
the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is offered for you. As often as you take it, take it in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat together. In the same way he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take and drink together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are here with us. We eagerly await the time that we can take this communion meal together with you in your kingdom. We love you, Lord, and Jesus, it's because of you that we pray. Amen. Oh, it's a good day. Amen. And we got exciting stuff coming up. We got uh, end of the month, May 28th, Memorial Day weekend. We're going to be having some baptisms. It is going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, we have some people who are still praying about whether it's going to happen, but we know uh, there's going to be three at least uh, and possibly more. If you have not been baptized and you believe in Jesus, you need to get baptized. We're going to have the tank full on the 28th and warm. <laughs> Come talk to me. We'll, 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 uh, we'll get that going. We'll get that all planned out. Uh, but I would love to have, if we get enough people signed up to be baptized on the 28th, I will cancel the sermon. I'll cancel, like, I'll, I'll bring out all the stuff. That will just be, that will be our service, just people going under the water and coming back out. We... We believe in baptism by immersion and emersion. Uh, <laughs> some people need a little extra time. No, just kidding. Uh, but no, that would be a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so uh, it's going to be a great day. I'm excited for it. But yes, if you have not been baptized and you believe in Jesus, you need to get baptized. The Bible says so. Right there. Uh, so that is announcements. Let's uh, move forward. We're going to go probably a little long because it's 1045 right now, but that's okay because we're going to be hanging out with Jesus the whole time, so that's a good thing. We are continuing. We are in part four of our series through Amos this morning. We're going to go through the first 17 verses of chapter five, so if you want to get uh, find that place, pull up your Bible app, pull out your physical Bible, find Amos chapter five. It's in the Old Testament in the Minor Prophets over there. Uh, but we're going to talk about this morning a lot, actually, about God's presence. So I don't want to spend a huge amount of time talking about it right now at the beginning because uh, we, we will be talking about it. But one thing that I want to emphasize about God's presence is that God is present everywhere. God is everywhere. That is a, a character trait about him. He is so uh, uh, massive, so huge that God is everywhere all of the time. There's not a single place you can go to to get outside of God's presence. He is everywhere. I know a lot of times in church we talk about uh, things like running from God, turning away from him, being far from him. Those are just figures of speech. That's, that's a, a way that we talk about things, that from our perspective, that's how it feels like, right? But the reality, even in those times where we feel far from him, when we have been running away from him, even in those times where that's how it feels to us, literally, because he is God, he is present everywhere. There's nowhere we can go to escape his presence, and that's a very good thing. On the one hand, because that means that no matter what time of the day or time of night, no matter what has just happened, no matter where we are in the world, at any particular point in time, we can turn to God and he is right there. There's nothing that separates us. There's nothing that can stop us from being with God because he is with us all of the time. On the other hand, that can be a bad thing. Because if we want to run away from God, if we want to escape his presence, good luck with that. 
There's nowhere we can run to where God is not already there, where he has not already been working, where he is not already exerting his power and his force into the world. If we don't want to have anything to do with God, too bad. He is here. He is outside of here. He is everywhere all the time. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, and then we'll jump into God's word together. Father God in heaven, you are holy, you are righteous, you are good, you are so magnificent and beautiful, and you are everywhere, Lord. God, our desire is for your kingdom to burst forth into this world. We want to see you build your kingdom, bring your kingdom here. We want to see, God, your desires being done, your will being done here in the world around us on earth, just as we know your will is done in heaven. We ask, Father, that you give us every single day exactly what we need to walk in your ways, to walk on the path that you've placed before us, to be your people. Lord, help us to forgive others when they sin against us, just as we know you have forgiven us for all of our sins against you. And Lord, help us to not fall to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, because Jesus, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And it's because of you that we pray. Amen. Amos chapter 5, starting with verse 1, says, Hear this word, O house of Israel, this lament I take up concerning you. Fallen is virgin Israel, never to rise again, deserted in her own land, with no one to lift her up. This is what the sovereign Lord says. The city that marches out a thousand strong for Israel will have only a hundred left, and the town that marches out a hundred strong will have only ten left. Chapters 3, 4, and 5 all began with these words, hear this word, and that told us that those were kind of literary units. Those were self-contained units, and that's why we took chapters 3 and 4 individually uh, that way. Chapter 5, however, as it begins with hear this word, we're going to split up into a couple parts. We'll go over the the next bit of chapter 5 next week, and the reason we're doing that is because Amos has indicated to us that these 17 verses in chapter 5 are a, a, uh, an individual unit in themselves. And he did that by utilizing, this is where we're, we're going to get into, this is our uh, English lesson for today. He's using a literary device called chiasm. Okay, uh, so chiasm, we, you heard me talk about inclusio before. I love talking about inclusio. I call it a scripture sandwich, right? That's where you got two similar elements at the beginning and the end, and they're the bread of the sandwich, and they're meant to point you to the middle, to the meat, everything that's in there. Having that kind of book ending of things points you to what's in the middle. Chiasm is like inclusio multiplied by its inclusio squared. It's, it's inclusio all over the place. Not only is there bread on either ends, but then you got like the, the mayonnaise and mustard, the condiments are there, and then you got uh, two pieces of cheese, and then you got some lettuce, and then you got some tomatoes, and then finally you got the, the meat in the middle. It's all these different layers, and every opposite end corresponds to one another, and all it's doing is pointing you to that thing in the middle as the most important point. Amos has used chiasm actually quite a bit throughout his book. And while the entirety of Amos is not exactly chiastic, uh, uh, that's that's a $5 word there, Uh, this passage occurs at the very middle, the center of Amos. And so all of his use of chiasm Uh, should point us to this passage as one of the most important passages. And the fact that this passage is itself a chiasm should tell us, whoa, hey, this is really important. We need to look at this stuff. And so we know that these 17 verses are one unit because of the chiasm that's in there. This lament that he begins this chapter with, these first three verses that is this lament, those correspond to the verses 16 and 17, which are another lament. And they kind of bookend, those are the bread of this chiasm here. We're going to see it. It's, it's going to be really cool uh, for you English nerds, uh, for people who hate English class. Sorry. But God takes up this lament about Israel. 
and he is weeping because God is about to bring this destruction. He's about to bring this punishment, and God is weeping about it. That is an important thing for us to understand, that God is not finding joy in punishing his people. Our God is a loving father who understands when his children need discipline. And it pains him. He doesn't want to see them go through this discipline. He doesn't want them to feel bad and to to feel all the, the bad feelings that go along with discipline. But God also loves his children enough to go through with that discipline, to make sure they learn from their mistakes and grow up to be productive members of society and all that stuff. So God has been warning his people, Israel. He's been uh, saying, hey, there's going to be discipline coming. You better shape up. Let's go ahead. We got to turn away from this. And we'll see, even now in this passage, he's not saying this destruction is assured. He's saying, hey, you can still seek me. You can still turn to me. You can still avoid this stuff. But if you don't, this is what it's going to look like. And it is going to be very sad for me. Fallen is Israel. Israel is going to be fallen. She's going to have no one to pick her up. And you go, wait a second, but God is there. Why can't God pick Israel up? And that's, that's the thing. It's, it's both uh, God's presence is there, but Israel has been running away from God. Israel has been trying to avoid God's presence. At every moment, God has been reaching out his hand saying, take my hand, turn to me. Let's do this together. Let's walk. To- come on, you said you wanted to walk with me. Let- come on with me. And Israel has said, no, I want to go my own way. I don't want to have anything to do with you. So even though literally God is right there watching Israel fall, he says there's no one to pick him up. Because even if God extended his hand to say, hey, come on, come, l- let me pick you up. Israel would say, no, I, I still don't want to have anything to do with you. God is crushed at the absolute decimation of Israel. This 90% of the armies that will go out will be destroyed, will be obliterated. Only 10% will be left. That is awful. And God is saddened not only because of the destruction, but also because he knows that even through that destruction, Israel is going to continue to go its own way, to reject him, to function as though God is not present with them. Verse 4, this is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. For Gilgal will surely go into exile. And Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. Or he will sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. It will devour. And Bethel will have no one to quench it. Even now, God is presenting that choice. And he's presenting it as a real choice, as though there is actually an option. They can turn to him, they can seek him, and they will live. He says, don't go. He brings up Bethel and Gilgal, which he brought up in the previous chapter. And we remember last week, we looked at that chapter, uh, and we saw when he talked about Bethel and Gilgal, those were important places of worship where the Israelites would go, and they would present their offerings and their sacrifices to God. And God said, I know that those sacrifices, those offerings, have nothing to do with me, but you're just trying to impress each other and one-up one another to show, oh, look, I gave this much. Well, I gave even more. Well, God loves me more, and I'm so important. I have God in my back pocket because I give him so much money. Aren't I great? Blah, blah, blah. And God says, I know those offerings aren't about me. They're about you. You're not worshiping me. You're worshiping yourself. So those offerings are actually sin that you're offering over there. So here he's saying, don't run over to those cities. Don't run to those temples. Don't run to those places to to provide more offerings. I'm not asking you to give me more money, to buy me off, to buy my affection. I'm asking you to have an actual real relationship with me. You don't know who I am. You've been turning away from me. The answer isn't to throw more money at me. You don't have to go to these places. They're going to be destroyed. And you don't have to run away to go find me. I'm right here. Turn to me. Seek me. And live. We're going to see that concept of, of seeking and finding life 
later on, uh, uh, we're actually gonna read this, this next section. We're gonna get to the end of that corresponding part in the chiasm there. But what we're gonna do as we read through this next section, you're gonna see verses eight and nine stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> And it's almost like if you were to read verse 7 and skip on to verse 10, it would seem like that's how it's supposed to read. And someone shoved verses 8 and 9 right in the middle of it. And that's because verses 8 and 9 come at the very middle of this passage. Verses 8 and 9, this chiasm, this, this multi-layered sandwich with everything pointing toward the middle. Verses 8 and 9, that is the middle. That is the most important part. So as we read this next section, keep that in mind. It sounds a little awkward that we get to verse 8 and you go, whoa, this, that's a jumping topic. Uh, uh, but, but let's keep that in mind as we read this next section. Verse 7. You who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteous, righteousness to the ground. He who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns blackness into dawn and darkness into day, uh, d and darkens day into night who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. He flashes destruction on the stronghold and brings the fortified city to ruin. You hate the one who reproves in court and despise him who tells the truth. You trample on the poor and you force him to give you grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. You oppress the righteous and you take their bribes. You deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent man keeps quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good. Maintain justice in the, courts, in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. It is a shame how difficult it is to translate words from one language to another. In the translation from Hebrew to English here, we miss out on quite a bit because not only do we have this chiasm in the entire passage, verses 7 and 10 both of those, the individual verse, is written with chiasm. Uh, verse 7, how it is, the, the beginning, the first and the last word are both the verbs. And then right inward, you have these nouns with the word to attached to them. And then right in the middle, you have the main nouns, justice and righteousness. So that in Hebrew, like it, it doesn't sound right in English, but in Hebrew, verse 7 would sound like, uh, uh, you who turn to bitterness, justice, and righteousness to the ground you cast. And so you have this kind of inward outward with the focus on justice and righteousness. It's very similar with verse 10 where there are verbs on the outside and then there's the main noun uh, next and then in the very middle are two participles. And th those take a really a lot of English words to translate so it just completely gets lost in translation. But in Hebrew, you have it's this beautiful chiasm in verses 7 and 10 that, again, point to that center bit, verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 in our Bibles, we see them, uh, verse 8 has two triplets. There's those three lines there, and verse 9 is a couplet. In Hebrew, those are written as just three lines. Each triplet is its own line, and the couplet is its own line. And so you got three lines there, and we're pointing toward the middle here, the very middle line. It ends with, Yahweh is his name. You have this passage where everything is pointing toward the middle, and even uh, the middle bits point toward the very inner middle bits. And once you finally get to the very, very middle place, the most important part in the entire passage, it says, Yahweh is his name. Who is this God who created the universe? Who is this God who calls his people to return to him, to seek him and live? Who is this God who is asking them to have a real relationship with him? Yahweh is his name. 
You know, when you go outside at night and you see those little points of light in the sky and you look at them with wonder and you go, oh, wow. And they even come together and they, they form these little constellations and that's beautiful. And we look at telescopes and we see uh, these supernovas and we see all this wondrous thing out in space. He is the one who put those stars in place, who named them, caused them to come forth into being. This is the God. Yahweh is his name. He controls all of the waters in the world, all of the seas as they rage and torment, all of, all of the, the oceans that swell and come over, all of the rain that falls down, the lightning that comes in the sky. Our God controls him. Yahweh is his name. He brings down nations to their knees. Any fortified uh, city that we can build to make it last and endure forever, God is the one who has the power to bring it to its knees, to bring it to rubble, to put it to nothing. Yahweh is his name. This is the whole point. And we need to know this God who is here with us. Seek him and live as opposed to this righteous, holy, powerful God, Israel has not been seeking him, has, not, has turned away from him. They have been seeking injustice. They have perverted the court system. Justice in their courts has less to do with right and wrong, with good and evil, and more to do with who has the biggest bribe to bring. And so farmers are coming in from the countryside with their grains, hoping that it's going to be a good enough bribe to get what they're hoping from the court system. He says it's so uh, terrible, this evil is so prevalent that even people who have some sort of moral fiber, who understand that this is not good, who would speak out and say, this is not right what they're doing, they know that it's best for them to just keep silent. Because their words are going to go on deaf ears. It's not going to change a single mind. It's not going to change a single way that the system works. And all it's going to do is cause more trouble on their own heads. God says, you pervert justice. You have been running from me. You have been loving evil. Turn away from evil. He presents that choice to them. Seek what is good and live. You think that you have bought my love. You think you have bought my attention. You think that, that I am here with you, that I am on your side. Well, guess what? If you start doing what I tell you to do, I will be on your side. It'll be exactly like you think it is. But you haven't been turning me. You haven't been listening to me. You don't actually have a relationship with me. You don't actually know who I am. I'm right here. I'm wanting you to turn to me. We're going to finish out this final lament that bookends this passage. Verse 16 he says, Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord God Almighty says. There will be wailing in all the streets and cries of anguish in every public square. The farmers will be summoned to weep and the mourners to wail. There will be wailing in all the vineyards. For I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. In all areas of Israel, from the cities to the countryside, everywhere, there's going to be weeping and wailing. Why? God says, because I will pass through your midst. There's going to be weeping and anguish because God is present there. How sad is that? Imagine if that was being said about here, that there is going to be weeping and anguish at Antelope Springs Church because God is present there. That is so sad. That is so terrible. Because the presence of God should be a joy. It should be a wondrous thing that we are proud of, that we are happy about. But for those who are wanting to escape God's presence... His very presence is a torment. That's the great irony, is that God, because he is present everywhere, for those who enjoy his presence, for those who are seeking his presence, they find him, and it is life for them. But for those who want to escape his presence, they cannot escape. They cannot find anything except for God, and it is anguish and torment to them. So the best thing to do is to turn to God, and let his presence be life for us. Amen? 
Now, what is that life? What is the life that God brings? It's not just about air continuing to go into and out of our lungs. It's not just about our heart continuing to beat in our chest. It's not about our our neurons firing in our brains, about something that a doctor could look at and say, yep, they're alive. The life that God brings is eternal life. And do you know what eternal life is? Do you know the definition of eternal life that we are given? We are actually given in the Bible. There is a place where Jesus says, this is what eternal life is. It's in John 17, 3. You can look it up yourself. But Jesus says, this is eternal life. That they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Eternal life is knowing God, knowing Jesus. That is life. Do you know this God who put Pleiades and Orion in the sky, who controls the very oceans and the rivers and the lakes and the seas, who brings rain on the ground, who topples civilizations to the the ground to dust? Do you know this God? Yahweh is his name. He is great and powerful and life that we have in him is all about knowing who he is. It's about having a real relationship with him, not running to a church building where we can give a lot of money and and we can have God in our back pocket and if we give him enough, then maybe he'll give us what we're wanting. But it's having an actual relationship with him where we are walking with him in lockstep, where we are following as he leads and he will take us to good and wondrous places. And when we seek him, we will find him because wherever we are, wherever we turn to him, there he is. But if we're trying to run from him, if we want to escape his presence, I'm sorry, (laughs) we can't. I mean, good luck, but it's not going to happen and it's going to be anguish and torment. Seek God and live. So what we're going to do this week, and hopefully even beyond this week, we're going to practice paying attention to God's presence in our lives. Because when we understand that God is everywhere, when, when we kind of pull ourselves out of our normal everyday routine and look around at us and realize God is present here, then we aren't just walking into a room to have a meeting with our coworkers to talk about whatever thing we're going to come up with. Here's how we're going to do this for the next week or the next month or year, or maybe as much as 10 years. Woo. It's not just this strategy meeting that we're walking into when we recognize God's very presence in that room, then this is a divinely ordained meeting where God is accomplishing his will. Oh, and that puts a whole new perspective on what we're doing in that room. When we recognize, when we pull ourselves out of what's going on around us and recognize that God is present in the room, then when we are having an argument with someone, then we are not just arguing with them, but we are yelling at God's child while God is there watching. Good luck. When we recognize God's presence around us, as we uh, go to work, as we are playing with our children, as we are walking around in our daily lives, when we recognize, pull ourselves out of whatever we're doing and recognize God is right there with us, it changes everything, brings a whole new perspective, and allows us to follow him much more closely, and we will find life. Amen? So I don't know what you need to do uh, uh, to to pull yourself out of that. It's difficult to do when we get into our routines, when we're kind of focused on this is what I'm doing right now. It's difficult to pull ourselves out of that and recognize, oh, yeah, hey, God is actually present with me. So if you need to set a reminder on your phone to go off at like 1.13, some really weird random time that you're going to forget about, and then it's going to go off and you're going to go, oh, yeah, God is here. Or if it's uh, putting a a sticky note on the dash of your car, so you get into your car and you go, oh, yeah, God's with me. Okay, I won't honk at that person, right? (laughs) Whatever it is, whatever little thing you need to do to remind yourself, to pull yourself out of the moment and engage with the fact that God is present with us where we are right there and he has something for us to pay attention to. However it is you need to remind yourself, do that. And this week, practice paying attention to God's presence, and see the life that he brings. Amen?
Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for calling us to yourself, for drawing us into your presence. God, we recognize your sovereignty. We recognize uh, your presence everywhere in this world. Lord, even when we are not walking in your ways, even when we choose our own selfish routes that we want to go to, God, we recognize that you are merely one single turn away that you are calling to us, that you are ready for us to follow you. Lord, lead us more closely into your presence. Draw us more closely to yourself. Help us to find the life that you promise. We love you, Lord, and Jesus, it's because of you that we pray. Yes.